much as it hath pleased our Heavenly Father uh, to receive to himself the soul of our departed sister. We therefore commit her body to the earth, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and in the sure hope of the joyful resurrection of all who sleep in him. What is death? Every living thing has to die, and yet what's death? It's the um, ceasing of electrochemical activity of the brain. I think it's just the end of physical being. If you've got a point to life, then it just doesn't end. What's the point of being born? Just to die. I am a Christian myself. Therefore, I believe there is a life beyond. But not having experienced it, I don't know yet. And I haven't really spent much time thinking about it. It doesn't worry me. I've no particular knowledge of whether there's a life after death. Uh, I don't hold with the Christian viewpoint of uh, a heaven and a hell. But I don't believe in heaven as such either. I mean, I don't think we all congregate in one place in space, and that's what heaven is. You'll live on in other people's minds, if, the, if you call that the soul surviving, I think. If you've made um, a success of your own life, then you'll succeed living on in other people's minds. But what is death? Well, that's a question that uh, is either very complicated or very simple. It's very complicated if you try and think of everything that has happened in the body, the patient's brain. But it's very simple if you look at somebody you love and one minute they're there and the next minute they're not there anymore. At one time, death was a commonplace occurrence in everybody's experience. Many babies and children died young and nearly everyone died at home. Remembering the dead members of the family was the basis of an industry. Lockets, brooches, rings containing hair, or a picture of the dead person. You could even buy mourning book markers. Whole families went into mourning for many months when one of their relatives died, and women often wore widow's weeds for the rest of their lives. In those days, it seems odd to us, but birth was more of a mystery than death. Children often gathered round a bed to see their mother or father die, or at least to see them when they were dead but they were told that babies grew under gooseberry bushes. Even little children usually know the truth about being born, but death is the mystery, hushed up behind hospital walls. We just don't like talking about it. Instead of saying that someone's died, we say he's passed away. In all sorts of ways, we dodge the shocking thought of actually dying. You would think that in a good cause, like trying to prevent deaths from lung cancer or road accidents, it would be a good thing to be as realistic as possible. This poster appeared on the walls about 20 years ago and had to be taken down because people found it depressing. In other words, it really did remind them that road accidents cause death and they didn't want to be reminded quite so well. And yet if you think about it another way, death is the most precious thing we have. Things which can't die, can't change. We've shown this speeded up sequence before. At the time, we were thinking about life, but it was also about death. Everything would have been jammed up if those very first creatures had not died. They got on the moving staircase, but unless they also got off at the far end to make room for others, nothing at all could happen. You and I are on that same moving staircase, and we have to step off in our turn. But is death then necessarily the end of everything? Do we step off the stairs and disappear? Right from the very first hint we have of early man, there has never been a time when men haven't believed in some form of existence after death. Many people used to believe that after death, they could embark on a journey for which they would need all the equipment and food that they'd required during their life on Earth. So their burial chambers were provided with weapons and provisions. The pyramids are among the largest and most splendid burial chambers that have ever been built. It appears that they were put up to protect the bodies of the pharaohs of Egypt and to ensure their safe passage into the next world. One of the tombs that has provided the best example of the equipment buried with the pharaohs is the tomb of Tutankhamun, a young pharaoh who died at the age of 18. All the belongings that were buried with the young king were found in the tomb in 1923. In Ur, 2,000 years ago, 
they buried with their king the food and furniture he would need in the next world. They placed with him this glorious lyre so that he shouldn't be without music. He also had a dice board so that he should have a game to amuse him. And they even buried his queen with him, together with several hundred of his servants, so that he should be well looked after. In China, people believed that members of the family who died were still part of the family, although unseen, and they made offerings to them, consulting them about important family decisions, telling them the family news, and visiting them on the anniversaries of their deaths. Hindus and Buddhists think of life and death as a wheel that circles round. Each soul is born, lives, and in time, the body dies. And then the soul is born again in another body. What sort of body we're born into depends on the sort of life we've lived. We might be reborn as animals. The wheel of life goes on turning until eventually we reach nirvana, perfection, union with God the last dip in the sacred river Ganges. Beside the dead, the living bay, both must be purified. After bathing in the sacred river, the eldest male relative of the deceased walks seven times round the pyre. As he walks, he chants a prayer, lightly touching the head of the shrouded figure with a wand of jute sticks as he completes each round. The ceremony of burning the body is not an act of destruction, but an act of deliverance, releasing the soul to live on in many other lives until eventually life's goal is reached. The Christian view is that Christ conquered death by rising from his grave, and that this gives us all hope of a resurrection and of eternal life. Indeed, Christians believe that they can begin to experience this close relationship with God right here and now. They cut me down and I lift up high. I am the light that'll never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Just as to a Hindu, how we behave in this life affects our next life on earth, so to a Christian, what we do in this life affects how we will be judged after death. In the Middle Ages, Christians used to believe that the dead person left his body behind in the grave. Then his soul was lifted up to be judged by God. If the dead person had shown by his life on earth that he had accepted God's invitation to follow Christ, he would be admitted to heaven, where he would be welcomed by Christ, the apostles, the Virgin Mary, and other saints. If, on the other hand, his life had been evil, he would be sent down to hell to be tormented forever by the devil and his demons. The old pictures of heaven showed it as a place of angels, harps, crowns, and feasting. The artists were trying to suggest that it was a place of light and music, a place where the faithful could be with God forever. Today, though, most Christians don't think of heaven as a place up there or down there. They think of it more as a state of mind or experience. Heaven to a Christian, or for that matter to a Muslim, is to be with God and to enjoy him forever. Hell is to have shut oneself off from the company of God. But to other people, all such talk is meaningless. They see death just as nothingness. But even people who see death in this way sometimes like to think that at least something of their influence will remain after they've gone in the lives of their children or in their work. Whatever we believe, death is real and people must die. It's the one thing that will happen, we know for certain, to every single one of us. Well, I have watched somebody that I love very much dying, as most of us have by the time you get to my age. And what I feel about it is that it's something which is very personal for individuals. Uh, and it is something which can be very much like, say, Pope John described when he said, my bags are packed and I can go with a tranquil heart at any moment. And it is a summing up, a packing of the bags, as it were, 
It's the time when people, in a way, add up everything that they are in themselves. Now, this happens all through life. I mean, when you go into an exam, you take with you everything that's ever happened to you, and you sum it up as you write out your exam. And in, a, in this sort of way, as you come to the end of your life, you're bringing everything that there is. But I think the other side that I said that there is one moment when the person is there no more, and in a sense they're not there that you can touch and see them anymore, but they are there inside you, in your memories of them, and in what you have learned from them, which will be part of your life always. Um, I would look at the thought of dying, uh, probably wishing that I wouldn't go suddenly. I would like to know. I would like to be able to say thank you and goodbye and sum things up. And I know that I am not very brave, but I also know that there are people who will help and that what I've got to learn is to trust. Um, I remember an old man who, two or three minutes before he died, all the lines in his face went quiet and he looked just like somebody who is meeting the person that they really wanted to see. Um, and I think that, to me, is a picture of what I believe about death. I believe we know God just a little bit in this world. Uh, I believe we will know him fully in that and go on learning. I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance, then, wherever you may be For I am the Lord of the dance is deep And I'll lead you all Wherever you may be, yes, I'll lead you all In the dance is deep I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee But they would not dance and they wouldn't follow me I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. They came with me and the dance went on. Dance, then, wherever you may be. For I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all. Wherever you may be, yes, I'll lead you all. In the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped me and stripped me and hung me high And left me there on a cross to die Dance When the sky turned black It's hard to dance with the devil on your back They buried my body and they thought I'd gone But I am the dance and I still go on Dance
party tricks to start this week's programme. First, the famous ping pong ball and vacuum cleaner trick. I'll switch on the blower and I'll float the ball freely in the air above it. There we are. Now here's another with a riddle. Alec, what will happen if I blow air between those two apples? They'll fly apart. Well, just let's see what happens. I take it all back, they come together. Right, second time. Your turn now. Now, if I may borrow that. A piece of paper is suspended from a book is our next trick. If I blow a jet of air over the top, what will happen to the paper? Power, please. Well, as you saw, instead of pressing down against the book, it rises up. And finally, how to make a spray gun from two glass tubes and a beaker of liquid. Well, the trick is you hold this one in the middle of the water and you blow across the top of it with the other one. Okay, Darren? Now, to prove that we're getting a spray, if you'll hold that up, please, we'll have a go. That's and there you are certainly did work that time. Well, it may seem all very trivial, and yet those four simple tricks hold the secret of how an aeroplane flies. Because they all work on a principle which is called Bernoulli's law. Now, Bernoulli was a Swiss scientist who lived in the 1700s, and he discovered that as the speed of a liquid or a gas increases, so the pressure of that liquid or gas decreases. Now, let's look at the party tricks again. The ping pong ball was pushed up by the stream of air. It stayed there when its weight was equal to the force of the air jet. And it couldn't fall out of the way because outside the moving air stream, the air pressure was greater. The same principle applied to the apples. Blowing between them, the speed of the air increased, its pressure decreased, and the air outside pushed them together like that. Same thing with the paper. The air blown over the top like this was moving. So its pressure was lower than the air underneath, and the paper rose up like that. And then the spray gun. By blowing across the top of the straw, Alec reduced the air pressure here so that water rose up the straw and then was blown out by the airstream coming through this side. Now, all simple sprays work on Bernoulli's principle with a rubber squeezer instead of a mouth blowing. So what's all this got to do with airplanes flying? Well, think of the shape of a modern airplane wing. The upper side is curved and the underside is almost straight. The engine pushes the plane through the air at high speed so that air rushes past the wing. The air going over the top has to travel a greater distance than that going underneath, so it has to travel faster. And faster speed means lower pressure. And as a result, the wing is pushed upwards by the greater pressure underneath. Now that is the basic principle of heavier than air flight, and it's called lift. And there are three other aerodynamic forces which have to be balanced against it and against each other. Weight is pretty obvious, but it has to be carefully calculated. Thrust is the forward movement, which provides lift. And drag is the air resistance against the plane. And that, too, is essential for lift. And these forces are like four hands pulling in opposite directions. When lift equals weight and thrust equals drag, the aeroplane is flying level at a steady speed. And the job of a modern aeroplane designer is to produce the best compromise between those forces for whatever job his plane is intended for. But none of this was known 200 years ago, and nobody recognised that Bernoulli's law could have anything to do with flight. Balloons of various kinds had flown from about 1780. But for heavier-than-air flight, everyone thought flappers were the answer. Yet the flapper machines never worked. Well, it was left to one remarkable man to work out the basis of heavier-than-air flight, and to find out more about him, we asked Alec to take a trip to the seaside. Scarborough. 170 years ago, in 1805, a group of men stood here in the little fishing village, firing strange streamlined missiles across the bay. Shells with exploding caps. Spinning projectiles with fins like the bombs dropped in World War II. Weapons far ahead of their time. Their inventor was a local baronet, Sir George Cayley, whose family seat was a short distance inland. This is Brompton, about eight miles from Scarborough. 
If you like poetry, you'll be interested to know that in 1802, while Sir George was inventing missiles in the hall, William Wordsworth was getting married in the church. So that by pure coincidence, two great but very different men almost met. But not quite. Wordsworth preferred daffodils to dynamos and rode away to become poet laureate, while Sir George stayed here to invent not only missiles, but an internal combustion engine, a caterpillar tractor, a breech-loading rifle, and an artificial hand. And most amazing of all, down in that little workshop in the corner of the garden, Sir George Cayley invented the aeroplane. Now, that may seem a very big claim for Sir George, but all the authorities now agree on it. He worked out the basis of modern aeronautics, and he built machines that actually flew.